World Partners of Renner Ministries. My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm standing in front of the main entrance to the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. You say, Rick, why did you choose to film in that particular location? Because this was the site of major strife in 1917. The Tsar abdicated the 1st of March. His title went to his brother who also abdicated. The Romanovs no longer wanted to rule Russia. So the leadership of the nation went to a provisional government and the provisional government actually moved into the Winter Palace and they settled here for a number of months. This is a very difficult time for Russia. And during that period, Vladimir Lenin began to plan his coup against the provisional government. And on October the 25th, about nine o'clock in the evening, the first revolutionaries came to the Winter Palace and they attempted to penetrate the palace through this ornamental, monumental gate, but they were stopped because of the guards working inside the palace. But that night, this horrible strife eventually led to the penetration of the palace several hours later that night, and it led to a civil war which lasted until 1922, in which millions and millions of people perished. But it all started right here at this gate on October 25th, 1917. It reminds me of Ephesians 4, verse 27, which says, give no place to the devil. You have to understand he's looking for a way to penetrate your life. He wants to find a way to get into your marriage. He wants to find a way to get into every relationship you have and spoil it. And just like the guards who protected this gate that night, you have to stand at the entrance of your life and say, no admittance, strife is not allowed and keep him out. And that is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner, and I've been waiting for you. And today we're going to begin a brand new series called Overcoming Strife. Strife is a door opener for the devil to get into your relationships, and you need to know how to shut the door to strife. And today, I'm going to be telling you a testimony of how God taught us this very important lesson to close the door to strife. You're going to enjoy it. But I want you to order the series, which is called Overcoming Strife. It is a five-part series, and my friends, this series is a life changer because if you can close the door to strife, you will stop the work of the enemy in your relationships, in your health, in your finances. If you can keep strife out, you'll keep a lot of bad things out of your life. So please order this series, and it comes with the study guide. And of course, when you read it, while you hear it, or while you see it, you really get this teaching down deep inside you. And by the way, this will be great to use in a Bible study or to give as a gift to somebody else. And we're also offering you right now my book, which is called You Can Get Over It, How to Confront, Forgive, and Move On. The back of the book says, No harbored offense is worth sabotaging your future. God has a glorious future for you. But if you've allowed strife or offense to get into your life, it can sabotage your future. And I wrote this book so you'll know how to confront it, how to forgive it, and move on. And I know that moving on is what you want to do. And this book will help you know how to move on from that offense and that bitterness or that strife that has tried to affect your life. Please order this. This book will really impact your life and it would be a great gift for you to give to somebody else that's struggling in a relationship. And as always, I want to tell you that when you become a partner with our ministry, we're going to send you my book called Life in the Combat Zone. The subtitle says, How to Survive, Thrive and Overcome in the Midst of difficult situations. And we always give this to people who become partners because this book is dedicated to partners. I'm not prophesying a combat zone. You're probably already in one. You need to know how to survive and thrive in it 
And that's why this book is for you. And we give it to anybody who becomes a partner with our ministry. And we also send the book called The Gift of Forgiveness by Denise. It's a small book, but my friends, this book is powerful. And again, when you become a partner with our ministry, we will immediately send you these two books as our way of saying, welcome to our family. And thank you for being a partner. And remember that right now on our website, at a very radical discount, we're offering you our autobiography called Unlikely, Our Faith-Filled Journey to the Ends of the Earth. Please order yours. You'll love this. And it's not just a story. It's also filled with a lot of teaching that will impact your life. And remember that if you need prayer, we're here for you. And we earnestly want to put our prayers to work for you. Whatever it is you're dealing with, give us a call or send us an email. And the moment we hear from you, we're going to begin to pray for you. But reach for your Bible. And today we're going to turn to Ephesians chapter four. And we're going to begin in verse 26, where the apostle Paul writes, and he says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. The New Living Translation says it like this. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. But the King James Version again says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. The word angry in Greek is the word orgizo, and this is a horrible word, and I'm going to read to you directly from my notes so you'll understand what it means. This word angry, the Greek word orgizo, depicts a silent resentment that gives way to an outburst of emotion, a deeply felt anger suddenly released, a swelling, growing, wrathful emotion that explodes in rage. We're really talking about rage. And the Bible says, don't let rage get the best of you. Let be ye angry and sin not, and let not the sun go down upon your wrath. What does that mean? Well, in Greek, it is the word paragidzo, the, from the word para. The word para means alongside, and the word orgidzo is the word we just saw, which is translated earlier as the word angry, and it depicts a silent resentment that gives way to an outburst of emotion, a deeply felt anger suddenly released, a swelling, growing, wrathful emotion that explodes in rage. But when you compound the two words together, the word para and the word orgizo, it depicts a silent resentment or rage para that is alongside of you. You go to bed with it like it is your partner. Well, if you're married, this is really bad because it means there's going to be something between you and your spouse. And that thing between you and your spouse is resentment. It is unforgiveness. It is rage. It is wrath. And it divides you from that person that you love. But the Bible says, whether you're married or not, you're not to go to bed with resentment and rage as your partner. Do not go to bed in this attitude. Denise and I made a commitment years ago that we would not go to bed if we had a problem with one another. First, we're going to work it out because we don't want anything to get between us. But then when you come to Ephesians 4, verse 27, Paul goes on to say, neither give place to the devil. Wow, that's powerful. This means that anger and rage gives place to the devil. It opens a door for strife. And in this verse, Paul says, neither give place. The word give is a form of the Greek word didomi, which means to give, to allow, or to permit, which means there are things we can do that allows and permits the devil to find a place in our relationships. He says, don't do it. Don't give place to the devil. The word place is the Greek word topos. The word topos describes a specific marked off geographical location, a real place, an entry point, and it is the very Greek word which depicts an opportunity. And what we find is when you're wrathful, when you're filled with rage, when you're angry and you don't resolve it, or when you're in a strifeful attitude, it literally opens a door just as real as any door to your house. 
And when the door is open, the enemy finds an access point to enter into your lives. It becomes an opportunity for the devil. And the word devil is the Greek word diabolos. The word diabolos we use as a name. We translate it as the word devil. But really, when you understand the word devil, translated from the Greek word diabolos, it really is his job description. It's a compound of two words. The first word is the word dia, which carries the idea of penetration. The second word is the word balos, which means to throw something like a ball or to throw something like a rock. But when you compound these two words together, it literally describes one who repeatedly strikes and strikes and strikes until he successfully penetrates an object in order to ruin it, affect it, or to take it captive. The name devil means to slander, to accuse, or to defame, to penetrate by continuous assault or to ensnare in a net. And you always know when the devil has found access because the way you think begins to be affected. Rather than think positively about that person that you love, you begin to see them through colored glasses where now you see every defect in their personality. You see what you don't like. Why? Because the defamer, the slanderer has gone to work in your mind and in your emotions to point out everything bad in that other person. And when you begin to have thoughts like that, that is evidence that the devil has found an access point into your mind and into your emotions. And very often you become ensnared almost as if ensnared in a net. Think of strifeful moments in your life when suddenly you got involved in a wrangling conversation with someone that was so unpleasant and it seemed you couldn't find your way out of that conversation. You're ensnared in a net. That's because the devil has found access to that moment in your life. Well, I'm going to give you a testimony from my life. Many, many years ago, Denise and I were traveling in a very small car all across the United States to preach in meetings. The car was so small, we didn't even have luggage in the trunk for place in our trunk for our luggage. So I tied it to the top of the car. In the back seat was Paul. And we had so much stuff in the back seat. Sometimes we'd have to look to make sure Paul was really back there. Philip was a newborn and Denise was carrying Philip on her lap. Well, when you're at tiny little quarters like that, you have opportunity for disagreement and strife. And Paul wouldn't stay in his car seat. So all the time I was wrangling with Paul, trying to get him to stay in his car seat. I'd pull the car over, put him back in his car seat. By the time I'd get back in my seat, he was already out of his car seat. And then Philip, who was an infant, was on Denise's lap and he would be crying. And we were driving for hours and hours and hours from one church to another church, from one state to another state. And one day, very late in the evening, Denise and I got in strife. We were driving down the road. And to be honest, it's very unusual for Denise and me to get into strife. We're just not strifeful people, but we got into strife. And while we were in strife, something terrible happened. I had a piping hot cup of coffee in the coffee holder between me and Denise. And in that strifeful moment, Philip reached over from Denise's lap and put his hand into that cup of coffee. Well, of course, it burned his hand. But we didn't realize how badly he was burned because we were driving late at night and the car was dark. He cried and cried. His crying became worse and worse. So finally we pulled the car over and turned on the car light. And when we looked, we couldn't believe what we saw. That coffee was so hot that when Philip put his hand into that coffee, it melted the skin from the bottom of his hand and the skin had slipped down from the bottom of his hand and it was laying on his arm. It was horrible. We rushed to an emergency room where they treated him. They had to take scissors and cut off all of that skin and wrap his hand and instructed us that while we were on that trip, every single day, we had to find an emergency room where they could treat Philip's hand. And for 30 days, we ended up in emergency rooms every day where they were cutting and trimming dead skin and treating Philip's hands. And Denise and I understood strife opened the door 
for that to happen to Philip. If we had not been in a spirit of strife, that would not have happened. Strife is a door opener for evil things. It gives place to the devil. And Denise and I made a decision at that time that we would have a no strife policy in our lives and shut the door to the devil. But later, there was a moment when I got into strife, and I want to tell you that story next. By this time, we were living in the former Soviet Union. It was the summer, and I had been invited to preach in Europe. So I said to Denise, let's go to Europe, and let's take our boys. It'll be a wonderful experience for them to travel and to see these churches in Europe. So the day came for us to go to the airport, and Denise was taking too long to get ready, and the boys were not serious about getting packed and getting into the car. And I became frustrated, and my frustration turned into anger, and then it turned into rage, and I began yelling, get in the car. If you don't get in the car, I'm going to go on this trip without you. And I found myself in a spirit of strife. Well, that week, a friend was going to stay in our home with her dog so she could take care of our dog while we were gone. Well, when I got into that spirit of strife, I yelled, and I said, fine, I'm going to load this luggage into the car by myself. And if you're not in the car in minutes, I'm headed to the airport by myself. So in a fit of anger, I opened the front door to take that luggage out to the car. And when I did, our administrator's dog ran out the front door and got into a fight with our dog, which was a massive St. Bernard. And I remember thinking, oh, wonderful. We need to go to the airport. And now our dog, our massive St. Bernard, is going to kill our administrator's dog. So without thinking, I ran down to the driveway and stood between the dogs just as our dog put his jaws around the neck of the other dog. And I thought, great, he's going to kill this dog. So without thinking, which is often what you do when you're a spirit of strife, you don't think right. I reached my hands into the jaws of our St. Bernard to pull it off of the other dog. And when I did, our dog chomped on the other dog. But the problem is he chomped on my finger. And when he did, he bit the end of this finger off. Now I'm standing in our driveway with blood pouring from my finger. I walk up the house, into the house, into the bathroom. I begin to wash my finger under the faucet and begin to wrap my finger with toilet tissue. I walked into the entryway as Denise came down the stairs, finally ready to get into the car. And I said, Denise, the dog just bit the end of my finger off. Denise said, oh, Rick, that's not a funny joke. I said, you're right, it's not. And I showed her my hand. Rather than go to the airport, now Denise and I got in the car and we drove to the hospital which was a very old, decrepit, Soviet-style hospital. And when they saw my finger, they checked me in as a patient and told me I had to stay all night in the hospital. The condition of the hospital was so terrible that the tiles were broken and falling off the walls. As we walked down the hallway to my room, we had to wave the cigarette smoke out of the way. And when I finally got into my room and got into my bed, I looked at my surroundings and there was a single light bulb hanging on a little wire from the ceiling. There was a sink in my room hanging lopsided on one screw. This was my new surroundings in the hospital. And the doctors and the nurses began giving me shots. And the next day they said, now, Mr. Renner, we need to tell you that there's a law in this country that if your dog has not had a rabies shot, then you have to have rabies shots. Has your dog had rabies shots? I said, no, it's our dog. Our dog doesn't have rabies. He said, unfortunately, that means by law, you have to have rabies shots. Well, that day they were giving me shots in my arm, in my bottom, just giving me all kinds of shots and trying to treat me and stop this bleeding. And he finally said, Mr. Renner, we're going to let you go with your children and your family to Europe to do your meetings, but we need to tell you something. These rabies shots are very serious. There are seven altogether. And if you fail to take one of these rabies shots on time, you will get rabies 
from these shots. So as you travel, we're going to give you the syringes, we're going to give you the chemicals. You have to find someone in every location to give you a rabies shot or you will get rabies. I remember laying in my bed thinking of the old movie, Old Yeller, how Old Yeller developed rabies and they had to chain the dog to a tree. I could just see myself foaming at the mouth because I didn't take my rabies shot on time. So I took the solution, took the syringes, with Denise and the boys and our luggage we got in the car, we flew to Europe with my finger all wrapped up, and every church we went to, I was humiliated when I had to say to every pastor, Pastor, do you happen to have a nurse in your church that can give me a rabies shot? <laughs> what kind of speaker was I? The speaker needs a rabies shot? And church after church, the nurse would come into the pastor's office and would say, Mr. Renner, pull down your pants, and we'll give you a shot. I'm about to preach the Bible in these churches, even to the very person giving me the shot in my bottom. I was humiliated. But from church to church, we went through this pattern, pulling my pants down for a nurse in every church with Denise at my side so I could get a rabies shot. Total, complete humiliation. And the Holy Spirit kept saying to me, all along the way, if you had not gotten into strife, the door would have never been opened for this. Well, finally, we came home and I had one more rabies shot to take. So I went to the hospital. I went to the emergency room. They said, Mr. Renner, it's good to see you. Go behind the curtain, get ready for your last shot. So I went behind the curtain, pulled my pants down as I had done in all those churches all over Europe. And the nurse came behind the curtain and looked at me and said, Mr. Renner, what are you doing? We give these shots in the arm. <laughs> and here, I had just pulled my britches down in churches all over Europe. I didn't have to. They were supposed to be given in the arm. But you see, I was in a spirit of strife when those injections were first given to me and I couldn't hear correctly. When you get into a spirit of strife, you don't think right, you don't act right, you don't hear right, it opens a door, it becomes an access point for the enemy to find his way into your environment. And that is why the Apostle Paul says, neither give place to the devil. Now, when we come back tomorrow, we're going to identify entry points for strife. If you can identify those entry points, then you can close the door and you can overcome strife. I'll be back in just a moment, and I want to pray for you. From time to time, strife tries to get into all our lives. Strife is an evil force that divides people, causes heartaches, and can even destroy relationships. Rick Renner says, years ago, Denise and I made a no strife policy in our lives and ministry, and it permanently shut the door to strife. And if you'll make the choice to have a no-strife policy, that decision can permanently keep strife out of your life. In this practical and powerful series, Overcoming Strife, Rick teaches how to stop giving place to strife in your life, how to stop your tongue from speaking poisonous words, how strife in its basic form is demonic and destructive, how to follow after peace and obtain it, how to permanently avoid the fruit of bitterness and strife. You really can permanently shut the door to strife. In this powerful series, Rick will help you to know how to slam that door shut forever, and it will change your life. This five-part series is available in digital or physical format starting at just $10. In addition, we're also offering you the book, You Can Get Over It. This 195-page hardback book is packed with solutions about how you can successfully deal with difficult people and how you can get over the hurts you've experienced in life along the way. You can recover. This book will show you how and it can be yours for just $15. Don't miss this special offer, the five-part series, Overcoming Strife, and the book, You Can Get Over It. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner, and today I am standing in the foyer of Rick Renner Ministries in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I just wish I could pick you up and bring you here to see all the wonderful ministry that is happening in this facility where we receive thousands and thousands of phone calls from people just like you 
who reach out to us for prayer and for teaching they can trust. Proverbs 10, 21 says, the lips of the righteous feed many, and we know that's our job. Our job is to feed many. And I wanna say thank you to you for everything you've helped us do with your giving. You helped us construct our studio, purchase this building, and now in phase three of our ministry expansion program, we're wanting to pay this facility off so we can liberate all that money to take the teaching of the Bible around the world on additional channels and venues. And by being a part of our giving team, you can really help us make this happen. If you're not already a part of our giving team, please pray about joining us. And together we can join hands and through teaching of the Bible and by ministering to people that reach out to us and by sending teaching products around the world, we can really change people's lives. And it's amazing to me that today it's never been easier to make an impact in somebody else's life right from where you are. Think about that. You don't even have to get out of your chair. Just go online or make a phone call and bam, by becoming a part of the giving team, you can do something that reaches beyond your world into somebody else's life to really make a difference. That is powerful. And according to the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus promises that if we'll go, or if we'll do what we can do to help others go with the Word of God, His power will show up in our lives. So thank you for praying about being a part of our giving team. And the moment you join, I want you to really expect the power of God to show up in your life. Well, today I've told you my testimony about how Denise and I learned to close the door to strife. And since that time, we have had a no strife policy in our lives, in our family, and in our ministry. We simply do not make room for strife. We learned that we can overcome it if we'll close the door to it. And I want you to order my brand new series, which is called Overcoming Strife. And it comes with a wonderful study guide. This will be so life impacting for you. And we're also offering you right now, my book called You Can Get Over It, How to Confront, Forgive and Move On. It's an easy read, but it's a life changer. Please order yours today. But I want to pray for you. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that you've told us not to give place to the devil. And that means we can do what we have to do to close the door. Help us to close the door to strife so the devil cannot find an entry point into our lives and into our relationships. I thank you for this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Be sure to join me tomorrow. We're going to be identifying entry points for strife and how to close the door to strife. But until then, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there is power. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of 